great pain um, just through the nature of existence and through the nature of what we witness and experience. And we're also able to share the healing of that and the joy that being alive can also bring. So I think this, this album kind of whether consciously or not has an expression of all of those things in it and when I hear it under the influence of something um, I'm like wow where did that come from because it, it's not me it's everywhere it's from everything you know welcome to the Mindspace podcast I'm Joe Flanders thanks for tuning in some important housekeeping today before we get to my interview with John Hopkins the big news is that this is the final episode of the Mindspace podcast I'm definitely feeling some mixed emotions here. I really love this project and will miss it a lot. And at the same time, I'm quite excited about the new project I'm moving on to and hope you will be as well. So here's the deal. Uh, as some of you may have noticed, I've developed an interest in psychedelics and psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. And as someone who's been working with clients for many years, the prospect of deepening and accelerating psychotherapeutic transformation with a powerful tool like psychedelics is really irresistible. So in the last few years, I've gotten trained and have begun working with psychedelics in my practice and really find it to be incredible, fascinating, uh, very meaningful. And in the meantime, Mindspace, the clinic I founded in 2011, uh, where the Mindspace podcast gets its name, um, was actually acquired in 2021 by a psychedelics company called Numinous, based in Vancouver. And I've been working there ever since, focusing primarily on training practitioners to deliver psychedelic-assisted therapy. Now, Numinous has invited me to become a co-host of its own podcast, Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers, PTF, as it's sometimes called, features psychiatrist Dr. Reed Robison, and psychologist Steve Thayer, discussing the science, practice, and art of psychedelic healing. Reed and Steve are two great guys with really immense experience working with psychedelics, research, treatment, intervention, uh, and I'll be joining their conversation, mostly contributing interviews with other experts in the field. So you can basically expect more of what you've been hearing from me in the last few years. So yeah, I'm really excited to be joining Stephen Reed over at PTF, and I hope you'll join me over there as well. They actually recently introduced me on the show, so you can check out that interview if you want to get a feel for it. Uh, we'll put the link, obviously, to that interview in the show notes here. And yeah, maybe just a final word of thanks to all of you for listening, and to all the guests that have made this journey so rich and meaningful for me, and to my pal Justin Kahn for his outstanding work as the producer of the Mindspace podcast. Wishing you all well. Take care. My guest on the show today is musician John Hopkins. It was a great privilege to interview John, who's both a musician and a producer. He's been creating and performing electronic music for over 20 years. He's written six studio albums and has collaborated and produced albums for Coldplay and Brian Eno. His album Singularity received a Grammy nomination for Best Dance Electronic Album in 2018. And his latest album, Music for Psychedelic Therapy, was written as a soundtrack to ketamine experiences. And as you'll hear in our conversation, it really hit the mark for me. We discussed John's motivation to write Music for Psychedelic Therapy, his collaboration with Brian Eno, his meditation practice, John's view of live music in the COVID era, the role of music in psychedelic therapy, how John used ketamine in the process of creating the album Music for Psychedelic Therapy, his views on the relationship between pain and beauty in art and life, and the Ram Dass lecture that formed the lyrics of the very powerful closing track on the album. Without any further delay, here's my interview with John Hopkins. John Hopkins, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. How's the day? Um, I'm in London. Um, it's extremely hot and sunny. It's very beautiful. Um, I've been um, talking to some people today, having a nice day of conversations and press, and uh, 
Yeah, but like like we were saying before we started, I think it's um, luckily it's an ever interesting subject. You know, the intersection between mm-hmm. music and healing and psychedelics. So, yeah, I find I never really get bored of it. So, um, yeah, it's been a it's been a very interesting day. And um, yeah, after we've finished, I'm going to go cool. and sit sit in the park and get some sun. Awesome. Um, so I'd like to start with your, your latest album. And that's really what then the focus of the interview is going to be here. Um, so music for psychedelic therapy. Um, and yeah, so I think you mentioned earlier, this was a, the title was a very deliberate choice. Uh, you stepped into, I don't know, maybe some new territory in your career. Not that you needed to, because you have pretty stellar uh, CV so far, collaborating with some of the top musicians in the industry, Grammy-nominated album. Um, What was the motivation to get into creating music for psychedelic experiences? It's interesting. I mean, I always approach um, every album without a plan, Um, and the older I get, the more trust I place in intuition and and the subconscious. But um, I suppose looking back, you know, I can retrospectively analyze how I ended up making it. And I think it's a combination of having had many psychedelic experiences myself and conversations with, um, my friend and yours, Dr. Rosalind Watts, who, who, um, asked me to help advise on, uh, the playlist, some of the tracks that would appear on the playlist that she was using for her, um, psilocybin for depression trials that she was doing for Imperial College here in London, um, it started to become apparent to me that whilst there's so much incredible music out there that works very well for psychedelic guidance, um, it tends to be like a playlist might comprise, if it's six hours long or whatever, it might comprise a hundred artists, you know, and that's like with each new track that comes on, it's like a new energy comes into the room for the, uh, the person who's on the journey. And I just started thinking more about how long form music needs to exist for that partly because I just wanted it myself, you know, and you you create what you want to hear in the world. Um, So there's a selfish element. It's like I just needed to have this music exist. Um, And and then when it came to the title, well, the the title actually came to me at the end of a ketamine trip, which um, when the album was in its infancy, um, but I was still, you know, I was at the point where the structure was in place and it was quite clear to me where it was headed. And then I think it was a little bit of an homage to Brian Eno's format of titling, you know, music for airports, music for films, um, which I just, I really love that kind of blunt functionality in conjunction with quite magical music. And um, so the title just appeared to me like the actual words. I could actually just see them at the end of this trip. I was like, okay, that's about the clearest download I could really expect um, about what I'm supposed to be doing here. So. You know, as we all know, on psychedelics, sometimes these messages appear in extremely literal ways, and um, you just go, okay, that's that then. <laughs> so that, I guess that's what I'm calling it. And then, you know, I mean, the thing is, I was already out, I, don't, I mean, the term being in the psychedelic closet is a, is a strange one, but I was already out of that, because Singularity, my previous album, had um, the DMT molecule on the front, and, you know, I talked a lot in that album about how psilocybin had ex- had shaped the the main tracks on the album so it wasn't like a bolt out of the blue really but but with this one it was just like okay this is much more serious and um you know if i'm going to create music for this space i have to take it with a great degree of of sincerity and and like put everything into it and um you know there's just been this lack of focus and lack of attention on the musical component in these journeys for particularly in all the i mean you know you can read endless wonderful studies with great results but you won't find mention of the music in them and um it it felt like you know calling it this and releasing it in this way um felt like a you know in my own small way as an indie artist just trying to get that conversation going a little bit more you know along with along with several others Hmm. yeah i actually i'm glad you brought that up because i've also noticed that i think it's it's one of the I don't know, maybe elephants in the room that music is such a central part of psychedelic therapy, psychedelic experiences more broadly. Um, it's pretty much, uh, 
yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty much accepted in the clinical trials and the kind of clinical application of that research in, uh, in clinics like the ones we have at Numinous. And mm. as you say, very little evidence base for that. Mm. And yet anyone who's ever had a psychedelic experiences, uh, experience will say, um, yeah, that the music was pretty important. In fact, um, in a recent non-ordinary state experience I had with some friends, I had curated a playlist and my friends said something to me like, Joe, how did you, where did you get that music? Like kind of giving me credit for it, which I didn't really deserve, but it's so front and center. Mm. And w what I find interesting is that, uh, I somehow sort of feel like your colleague all of a sudden, because, mm. um, you're contributing to the healing and the therapy of the people experiencing your music, uh, for psychedelic therapy. What does it feel like to you to be contributing in that way? Like, um, uh, like directly involved, very personally involved in people's mm. healing through the music you're, you're producing. Well, once you start to really think about it, it's actually very intimate and very strange that it's even possible because I know yes. that from, from before I made, from before the time when I made this record, when I listened to, um, tracks that I love that work you know, by other people that work very well in the psychedelic space, I'm finding myself so deeply involved with their psyche and their experience of being human. And that's, mm -hmm. I always find myself wondering, like there's this artist called Donato Dozzi who made a track called Vaporware One, and I recommend this so wholeheartedly. It's one of the most inspirational pieces of music for me ever. Um, I find myself wondering, like, where does that, because I don't know him, I've never met him, and I'm fascinated by where that comes from. Mm how that exists and am I listening to the inside of someone's soul and heart because that's what it sounds like and yet I've never met this person mm -hmm. and yet we all know each other on the deepest mm -hmm. possible level like we all share a consciousness and mm. so um, that's why I think it has to be taken really seriously if you're going to do it and you're going to make it clear that that's what you're doing because you're if people are essentially trusting you with something and this is something I couldn't have done five years ago you know like let alone when I first started out in my late teens, like I wouldn't have had a clue. It's taken me until my mid mid ish forties to to actually go. Okay, I think I know what might be helpful for some people. You know, there's an, it's not going to work for everyone, but you know, there's if it works for me, then presumably it must. <laughs> there must be some chance that it will work for others. Um, particularly when it comes to the sonic side, I think um, you know we. I think we exist at this fascinating frontier in so many ways many many ways of which are scary but some of the ones that are incredible are how um new technologies such as well ketamine is a new thing um and the ability to create truly immersive music that comes from an intentional place and you know, allows you to create 360 sound the illusion at least of 360 degree sounding music um and then in you know with new technologies like dolby atmos and and all the other forms of much more detailed surround sound that we have you know and the album was mixed in dolby atmos as well so there's like a 16 channel version that you can go to certain places and hear these technologies have emerged for a reason at a timely point um you know and it's a reaction as well to the instant gratification kick of of the fact that you can listen to any song ever made immediately without really thinking about it by by streaming so um you know whenever one whenever one force like that becomes dominant and too powerful then the opposite will arise so it's a reaction in a way to many things um yeah and it's what we need is obviously my view as, as a sort of composer and sound based someone who's interested in the properties of sound for healing um it's not a coincidence that these things have become available when they have hmm. yeah let's stay on technology for a second i know that you have collaborated with ned kalin on um sorry i know Mendel. that you've collaborated with mendel kalin hmm. on uh on wave paths and that's actually a tool that we use at Numinous. Yeah. Yes. And I wanted to share a couple of experiences with you because I'm actually just super curious to hear your answer to this question. So first of all, let me say, I actually did um, a psychedelic therapy session yesterday as a therapist. Mm. 
and we were listening to music and the participant was struggling to sort of connect with what was happening internally. And we were encouraging her to use the music as an anchor. And one of the things I invited her to do is think about the fact that there is a human who wrote uh, and or performed this music and they were trying to express something about their experience and that you can connect with the human on the other end of the music. And I think she found it helpful in terms of like stabilizing her attention and and just connecting with the emotions that were sort of available and sort of in the room for her. Mm. And then relatedly, um, I tried wave paths myself a little while ago, again, um, experiencing an altered state. And I sort of had this moment of like, Ugh, I don't like this. Who am I relating to? Mm. It's like, where, where is this music coming from? Is it an, is it like a, a bunch of code an algorithm? Is it like mm. a bunch of humans that like have been sliced and diced and delivered something to me through? Like it was hard for me to connect to the sort of human emotional source of the music. Mm. Um, and then like quickly I changed back to like hearing someone who was expressing something more directly. Just wanted to get your, your sort of take on that. And I'll just say, by the way, I asked my friend who I was journeying with if he wanted to try it. And he's like, Ooh, that sounds kind of terrible. It's like eating a meatball that was grown in the lab instead of, (laughs) instead of the Hmm. real thing. Um, just I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. Just really curious to hear your kind of take on that. Well, I think what's interesting about wave pause is that it is, um, it's all the music you hear on wave pause is, is separate human beings creating things in harmony with each other it's actually quite a beautiful thing um it embraces the fact that this technology exists and mendel and his team have brought this to life and they've got in touch with the composers they wanted to work with and um you know i believe that something that you know one of the first things they were was working with was one of my pieces and um to the reason that a lot of the music you hear in wave passes in the key of f is because (laughs) my first piece was in the key of f and um I think a lot of the things that were follow that the things that followed that that composition were they were you know obviously it's gone far beyond that now and I'm sure it goes all over the place now but certainly last time I spoke to Mendel there was a lot of um stuff that had grown out of what I originally wrote so really it's a kind of very modern way um of humans collaborating with each other um they don't need to meet but they're meeting in in a different space you know they're meeting in out, out there and, and the internet somewhere and also in, in people's minds um, so I tend to view it from that way I personally haven't I mean I've listened to I've had you know when I've hung out with Mendel I've just he's, he sometimes just has it on in the background set to a certain very low interference mode and it's amazing it's so it just sounds amazing this is clearly you know this is clearly human constructed music it has heart and, and it's beautiful and it's tasteful and there's so much dreadful music out there in the in the healing in quotes sphere so uh, he has good taste in music and uh, so it's it's kind of very human in a way you know it just embraces what is possible um you know and if there was it i don't think it's technically possible due to the nature of my album but if there was a way of wave parsing it so that you could for example just you know in the heavier sections and say the the patient was going through something um, very deep and wasn't ready to leave that zone then it would be amazing if the therapist could keep it there for a bit you know but obviously that's not it's just the the, the in like the the level of complexity in the sound design and the composition is such that like it's not possible as it stands but um maybe one day you know we'll be able to actually do that because obviously you know my record just has a, a structure that is unchangeable but um on the flip side, then that structure is, is there for a reason and it comes from decades of my own healing work. And, and so, you know, I think there's room for both really. And, and also, ultimately, I did just make an album that is also just an album. And Wave Pass is a whole new format, really. It's like, there's nothing like it. And um, so, yeah, I, I really think there's there's room for all of this, really. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks. Um you yeah you just said 
you sort of made this album with uh, like uh, borrowing from years and years of your own experience. And I've heard you talk about this album being very personal, like more personal than your others. Um, and I started to think about that and this is a bit silly, but you know, I did some like English literature in college and I remember learning about the romantic theory of art, which basically says artists, um, produce art, uh, and, ex uh, as a, as a kind of way to process emotion, right. That we sort of live these complex emotional lives and we express, um, our truth and, uh, and our experience through whatever tools that we have, whether it's language or music or, um, other, you know, visual art or whatever. So to the extent that you're comfortable sharing, what was it that you were, what emotional experiences were you processing in generating this album? Well, I'll go back to what I said earlier where, you know, I don't, I, I don't tend to be conscious necessarily of what I'm doing. Um, when I'm writing is it's almost like a trance state it's certainly a flow state um I mean there were some clear things going on like okay so we're not allowed to see each other because there's a pandemic on there's, there's that it was 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 present in the creation of some of it but I don't think I think it this was music I would have written either way it's just you know I had the space to write it um but you know I was going through a breakup and, and loss and, and heartbreak and things that were like well to a level i'd never experienced before and um but then at the same time you know i think every record at some point i've made sometimes i can't i can't honestly can't tell you where some of the darker stuff i've made comes from but i can point to events in my life um which will eternally need to be processed by me because you know things happen in the formative years and the word formative has that meaning for a reason um and so you know there are certain sort of like that core wound whatever it may be we all have one i think of some kind and um are eternally trying to heal it um and as i got older and, and more in touch with that i'm more and more clear um that all the music making is is a direct response to that really um and then i'm also a big believer that we share we share a lot of the pain um you know you could look at immensely privileged life that I have had um in that I'm you know I've never been uh in in physical danger particularly or threat of hunger or any of these things but you know be, having those things not not be an issue does not mean you, everything is fine you you can go through immense you know it's just, it's not exactly the a known truth that people with money are happy you know there's a there's a shared that pain pain is obviously there's there's huge uh, spectrum, massive spectrum here of what people go through um, but it's possible to be very very um, I don't know I just, uh, I think we all share um, great pain um, just through the nature of existence and through the nature of what we witness and experience and we're also able to share the healing of that and the joy that being alive can also bring um, so I think this this album kind of whether consciously or not has uh, an expression of all of those things in it um and when i hear it under the influence of something um i'm like wow where did that come from because it, it's not me it's everywhere it's from everything you know hmm. 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 um there was something i wanted to ask you about that actually came out of my experience listening to your album um, in a training experience I had uh, with ketamine. And I actually want to do a bit of a deep dive into that in a little bit. But um, I wanted to come back to this kind of this universal quality, right, that we mm. share the pain and we share the healing. And mm. one of the what felt like universal, and I've heard you speak about this in other interviews, and I wanted to kind of follow up, but these kind of like universal themes or archetypes or something was this uh, really um, like poignant and very clear expression of this, um, this flip side, uh, like this, yeah, this experience of like sadness and beauty coexisting. Mm. 
And um, the, I think you talked about that's a, a sort of a territory that you're comfortable in that you um, that you tend that you find yourself expressing about. Mm. Um, and that came through very uh, loud and clear for me when I listened mm. with the sort of enhancements uh, of the ketamine. Mm. Um, pretty open-ended question here. Um, I there's something healing about being in touch with the beauty as the flip side of sadness. I'm just wondering what, what does that mean to you? Or like, why do you think that is? It's difficult to say. All I know is that beauty in quotes, it's not an isolated feeling or concept. For me, the most beautiful things have a tinge of sadness or melancholy or, I mean, even extreme joy. Um, when it has an emotional counterpart of some kind that's a little more complex um there's, there's more nuance there's more reality i don't know it's like a good example musically would be radiohead where you have all these songs of just extreme poetic beauty with moments of real heartbreak but also moments of joy there's this there's this kind of synergy between those two states and those two emotions and um it's always been the most interesting to me i've never really known why but apart from just to observe that when you like for example when you go and view something truly beautiful like so one of my first what i call kind of awakening experiences was um at the grand canyon with my brother when i was 19 and we just we walked down it as far as we could go in a day um it turns out you're not supposed to do that um <laughs> it turns out that it turns out that like the 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 park uh, rangers that are walking up saying it's time to turn back now it's like you should listen to them because but they were turning there it's like it's 3 p.m and they were like um you turn back and we're like well no we, okay we will but we just thought no we want to go to the bottom so he walked all the way to the first kind of edge and at which time it happened to be sunset and um you know we weren't paying any attention to getting back that idea didn't matter at this point we were very much in the moment and i saw the sunset down there and then i saw you know the the shape of the, the you know the south rim the bit that's most most like um, most hotels are and stuff is like this kind of curved shape and then when you're in the middle of that at the top that looks like the whole thing and then when you get to the bottom of this first section you can see another of those curved shapes just as big one along and another one along and, another, and again and again and again infinitely smaller and smaller to the horizon and you and you should see you know this mess of hotels and restaurants and people it's just one tiny blob of light and then there's absolutely nothing but the sky and then i just had this immediate realization of our place in things and my first true kind of nature-based epiphany of you know that the entire cosmos really um and us as so minute and yet that being an empowering thing because it, it can bring you together and i remember that's that's both a beautiful and a sad realization um there's something a little bit ineffable about it and something there is something inherently sad and and also ecstatic about the fact that we're here briefly and uh you know um that's just how it is <laughs> it's the nature of the human condition and we're lucky to be able to feel those things and maybe beauty without sadness is meaningless i don't know hmm. it's um I, I'm I'm with you 100. percent It what 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 I'm hearing or how it's resonating with me is that um, you when you see something beautiful, um, you quickly become aware of the temporary nature of it or of our experience of it or you know the temporary nature of our lives or whatever and you know, from a Buddhist perspective, I know you're a meditator. I'd wanted to kind of check in with you about that as well. Being aware of and in touch with the impermanent nature of being is an extremely important sort of foundational mm. insight. Mm. And it's something that's also extremely important and therapeutic in a psychotherapy kind of environment as well. Right. Um, so that's sort of what your, what your kind of story there makes me think of. Um, I'm not sure if that resonates with you, but um, yeah, I wonder is, does your meditation practice, uh, come in, uh, kind of play at all with this, um, you know, sad beauty kind of space? 
It's interesting because um, the meditation that's central to my life is transcendental meditation, and um, this is something very, very distinct from all the other forms I've tried. Um, I do I do regular breath work and Kundalini meditations, quite you know chakra specific things that I need um, for other reasons. But TM is like my baseline, and that's that's actually something that's more akin to presence and peace and doesn't really um it might open you up to be able to feel more generally it's like um the whole spectrum of life experience is enhanced by it for sure but it does also have a a deep a deep calming influence and i think it's because when you transcend daily like you you get accustomed to that experience um fear of death decreases and you can actually embrace impermanence perhaps as but it is a beautiful thing as well. Like, who wants to, who wants everything to stay the same forever? Like, that's that's not, you know. And, and I think, as anyone who's had a very potent psychedelic experience with something like DMT, you quickly become aware. I think, anyway, that um, you don't know everything about the nature of consciousness and what happens to it after your your physical body is not there. You know, and it, it changed me from staunch atheism into complete agnosticism, or or even to believing in something just not not willing to name what i you know there's no name <laughs> this is ineffable but um there's a kind of um i mean I, I embrace the the ending of things it doesn't you know but <laughs> sadness doesn't have to be a, a negative it's not a it's not like you view something beautiful and immediately go oh but that's going to end it's more like oh that's going to end therefore it's all a pointer back to the present it's all like a an arrow going okay so the moment is the thing and that is clearly that's a shared view across so many different disciplines that there's definitely something in it yeah thanks for that um so l let me come back to the experience i had um on ketamine listening to your album shortly mm. after it came out um thoroughly thoroughly enjoyable experience um, yeah. healing in kind of surprising ways, mm -hmm. uh, definitely had the sense of like, there's something sad here. I, f I feel a little bit sad, but it's also incredibly beautiful. And I sort of thought like, huh, like feeling like music for psychedelic, so, sorry, music for psychedelic therapy while I'm taking this like potent antidepressant, it's obviously more than that. It's like, and I still feel nice, interesting, kind of like not what I expected. Mm. The the sort of crazier, weirder experience I wanted to ask you about was, I remember at one point, like I just had this impression that the music fit with the experience of the ketamine so well. I mm. could not believe it. I was like, <laughs> I literally had the thought like, wow, this ketamine is really good at music. That's and cool. so <laughs> my, <laughs> my question to you was like, what the hell, man? Did you do that? <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, <laughs> no. So, so I don't know. But um, what I experienced the first times I had ketamine, which was when I was 27, 28, I had no idea what I was doing. And you know, it's just like, mm -hmm. oh, there's this thing and you're, you know, your mates are taking it and maybe you've had some drinks first, which is deeply inadvisable. But I did, <laughs> before overdoing it one day and having what was definitely a dangerous and terrible time, I did have some experiences with it where I was like, oh my God, it's like music is a, a place, a structure. And I remember yes. when, when ketamine, you know, it wasn't really widely what at all discussed as anything that could be um, a deep um, healing modality like it is now. Um, but, um, you know, it had a reputation here in the UK as a sort of slightly grotty club drug that, you know, with the word K-hole, which I can't stand because it's a sacred space that you go into. You know, you shouldn't be at a club when you do it, in my opinion. Um, it's it's each, each their own to do what they want. But, like, it doesn't. that's the last place I would want to do it. Um, it has this incredible ability to turn. Like, it's almost like a blank canvas. That's how I think of it. So if you were to do it with no music in a empty room on your own i mean you, you i don't know i feel like you can guide yourself inwards to a degree but it seems to me more open to um external influences like music and setting i mean i guess every psychedelic is but there's a like when you described it as nice still you know or that word or safety or safety even 
Um, I always find that fear isn't really a part of it. And that, in the same way as MDMA, there's something that allows you, therefore, perhaps to go further. Um, you know, if you can approach difficult parts of yourself or your shadow from a place of non judgment and safety, then you know, sometimes with mushrooms it can be like so brutal or terrifying, or it can also be the opposite. It really. You know, you get strong moments of self-love, but also deep moments of shame. It, and ketamine just doesn't seem to have those things so much. It's like, um, so to go back to your question, I think like if this album works well for that, it's because that's what I was, if, I don't know, that's just kind of, that's how I was testing it. That's how I was making it. Um, I would test it on ketamine every few weeks and see how it, it's like from an audio point of view even just a technical point of view um listening to it in that state of receptive uh receptivity is that word i don't know um it was like there is no sharper magnifying tool than that so you know my normal waking consciousness i could hear a certain section there's a track on there called love flows over us in prismatic waves um these titles were not built to be read out loud <laughs> as I'm discovering, but um, they're more. You know, the titles are supposed to read like one one simple poem, really. But um, that track has this section, like a couple of minutes in, um, which I knew the intention of all along, but I sonically hadn't got right. But I wasn't aware of how wrong I'd got it until I went in there on ketamine and listened. And I was like, "This is this is off. This is like wading through shit. It's awful. It's like it was very extreme how wrong it was." Whereas in, in normal consciousness, you'd hear it and go, yeah, that's, you know, that's okay. That's okay. That's nice. But it wasn't at all okay. It was like this something jarringly wrong about this. Um, you know, we're talking in minutiae here, but just several of them being out of place. So I rebuilt that section with the information I'd brought back from that trip. And, um, and now it is how it's supposed to be so that's an example of perhaps how it's tailored very specifically for Kessman because yeah that's how that's how it was tested and that was the tool really um it's not like you know like going into it to that degree is a bit like the equivalent of playing it on the big speakers in the studio for your record label or your management or whatever it's like the really analytical listen um and so it's, it's actually incredibly unforgiving and uh, that's what it needed to be because like you know like i said earlier i take the i take the job very seriously of providing music for these experiences so it's got to be it's got to be right yeah so um i think here about your fellow brit robin carhart harris who mm -hmm. published one of my favorite articles on the neuroscience of psychedelic experiences um arguing that the most important mechanism, uh, neuroscience or neurobiological mechanism um, that psychedelics uh, bring to the brain is sensitivity to context, right? Okay. Which has become dialed in so much, right? It's, it's, it's the kind of the neuroscience version of set and setting, yeah. right? You have to take care of set and setting because people become really, really sensitive to that stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, it just sort of occurred to me hearing you talk about this, like, what a insane gift or very sort of different novel experience for a musician such as yourself to be creating something in a very particular mind state, like um, non-ordinary, uh, enhanced by this molecule. Mm. And then your listeners are going back, taking the same molecule, entering mm. the same non-ordinary state and... Um, again, there's that sense of like fit and shared experience, which can you get any other way as a musician, like creating, like how, how else would you, um, yeah, create such a strong fit between what you're creating and expressing and what people are hearing on the other end? Yeah. I mean, this, feeling. this is definitely the most intimate connection I think I've felt with, um, yeah, what I'm making and what people are experiencing, but the equivalent, the closest equivalent would be like, you know, if you look at my dance music output um, or techno stuff or whatever you want to call it, um, the MDMA influence on that is felt by the crowds that are experiencing it. You know, this is a very much more external experience. It's not so much about inward looking. It's more collective. It's more sharing rhythm together. But that's that's um, there's something in common there as well. But 
yeah but this thing is like a very very inward version of that you know like the deep inward dive and you know, i was i was talking to a friend the other day about this for some reason and um he said the first time he listened to this record he was like i really want to go on a, an amazing walk in nature and put this on on, on good headphones and he found off the first track he said, this is wrong this doesn't it doesn't lend itself it's not it's not supposed to accompany the outer world um he found he's just like he had to turn it off and then when he got back home he he turned the lights off and listened to it on the sofa and it's like yeah that, that's what it's for it's not you know you're the this is a very specific pointer inwards um yes you be looking at the most beautiful landscape in the world but i don't personally think that's what it's for and it doesn't it doesn't make sense in that context so um it's an extremely yeah. precise kind of thing what it's for in a way yeah and i get people yeah, sometimes again, saying really sorry i just say no, i get some, sometimes sometimes people saying that they put it on if they want to maybe like have it on while they're cooking or something and they just keep finding that it doesn't it's either they either have to sit down and listen or put something else on so it doesn't lend itself to casual yeah. i think it's because it's just quite a serious sounding thing and that's just where i was at the time or well, that's what needed to come through who knows you know i had that exact experience this past weekend i oh, really? went back to the album mm. um and i was out in a jog and it was like this <laughs> does not <laughs> work and actually w one of the one of the realizations like um the rhythm of jogging is too fast right and and it's kind of what happens a little bit uh, with ketamine as a dissociative anesthetic like mm. things really slow down yeah right yeah so and i just like suddenly quite struck by sort of the pacing and what you know, what sort of I needed to be doing with my body and my attention and running was not it. As you say, it's a very sort of precise thing that it's calibrated for, mm. except I actually had a really profound and beautiful experience listening to the last track sitting around the fire, which I'm going to ask you about in a minute, mm. but there was something about that. Maybe it was the lyrics that, um, allowed me to connect to the music in a way that I couldn't with the other tracks. I don't know if you have any explanation of that, but just wanted to share that I, I sort of, yeah, I've, I, I've had the experience of, of understanding the precision, right. Of having it really fit when I did it with ketamine and really not fit in doing something else. So wait, but did sit around the fire fit with jogging? Is that what you're saying? Yes. That's yes. great. That's it, great. I mean, yeah, I yeah. Wasn't... go ahead. No, no. I, um, sorry. Cause your picture is off at the moment, but, um, I um yeah. I think it's like the well it was the entry point to the album it was the first thing that we released from it and um uh -huh. it's it's a less abstract piece of music and it doesn't really have sadness about yes. it yes um and there is yes. a, a great spiritual teacher's words there and, and they were recorded beautifully on yes. a tape machine 40 years yes. ago well, way before I was born actually 50 years ago or whatever um so there's a timeless kind of universality to that I think, and then there's yes. East Forest, East Forest, beautiful backing vocals there as well. Um, so yes. yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's like it's the it's the single, it's the radio single. <laughs> so maybe it just has, maybe, maybe that's the gateway, <laughs> the gateway drug for the album, as it were. Right. I I, I should add that um, I was sort of like going through something personal on mm -hmm. that jog. Yeah. And I was out in a country road mm. um, in a beautiful natural setting. So like if I was on the treadmill, I don't think it would, I don't think it would quite have the same the same impact. Why well, I, I honestly this is a divergence, but like I don't understand why treadmills exist outside of you know <laughs> is, I think when we when we look back yeah. at this this ridiculous era of history, the things that will be laughed at, well that's definitely one yes. of them. <laughs> you know? I mean, unless you're literally somewhere where it's impossible to go outside, um, go outside yeah. <laughs> and run you're 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 talking to someone who um will continue running outside in january in montreal which is That's you know <laughs> not a comfortable place to be running outside and i yeah i'm i'm with you on the treadmill thing <laughs> yeah i think um i'm the same i, I actually I actually really welcome the extremes of weather when running i think it's enlightening uh -huh. and empowering to go oh yeah you know what i mean wim hof method has helped with this a lot but just um knowing that that cold isn't going to hurt you and understanding that actually right. you have it within you to resist it i mean running in the rain is the best you know running in the cold you're gonna warm up it's great yeah it's good for you yeah so and there's something about finishing the run 
you know, being very, very underdressed and still feeling sort of powerfully protected from the mm. elements. It's a mm. really awesome feeling. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I think I'll take the opportunity here to, to, you know, do a bit of a deeper dive on, um, music on, on sitting around the fire. First though, um, really interesting to me that the convention, and again, no science on this, the convention is, uh, typically music for psychedelic experiences doesn't have lyrics, right? Right. Um, and wave paths, uh, stuff doesn't have lyrics and, yes. and all the tracks except sitting around the fire don't have lyrics. Mm. Why do you think that is? Why do you think instrumental music is a better fit for psychedelic experiences? Well, I think talking to Mendel and the wave path perspective and, and to Ros as well is it's like lyrics are, um, perhaps too precise, an influence or too too much of a direct non-abstract um communication from the artist you know if you i personally love having songs on part of my you know if i'm tripping to to something i would i will always have some songs on because it, i don't immediately get guided away from the you know from the experience by that but in general i can see how it brings in elements of culture, even through the accent of the person singing or talking. Um, there's just all this other energy that's brought in by it. So I guess it feels like a safer kind of broader, perhaps more more accessibly and um, relevant thing. Um, when I was, I mean, I'm making instrumental music anyway, um, and collaborations with vocalists I've done have generally been off the albums, but this track um was clearly supposed to be the end of an album and it appeared you know when east forest east forest um i'm very grateful that he sent me this talk to work over and then he made the amazing vocal parts behind it and um it was just so wild to me that i would have ramdas at the end of my album uh, but to me it to me it seems like um it's sort of summing up the experience and putting I suppose there's a big difference between this kind of thing and then just having a song on with lyrics, because these these words that he's stating are sort of for me the heart of it all, the heart of existence, and certainly summing up the intention of the album and, and therefore what you've gone through for the last hour. Um, and it's interesting; people have generally found that um, it's a deep release when you get to that end bit because. No longer are you just alone with your thoughts on your journey. You've you've got someone who's been through all that to an in, incredible degree further than most of us ever will, and come back with this wisdom. So, um, yeah, <laughs> that's why it's there. Yeah. Um, I I want to actually ask you about the lyrics. Mm. Um, yeah, I was really really touched again. Uh, listening to them recently. And if you'll humor me for a second, I'm just going to read the last section so that the listeners know what we're talking about. So it goes something like this. As if in each of us, there once was a fire. And for some of us, there seem as if there are only ashes now. But when we dig in the ashes, we find one ember. And very gently, we fan that ember, blow on it, it gets brighter. And from that ember, we rebuild the fire. Only thing that's important is that ember. That's what you and I are here to celebrate. That though we've lived our life totally involved in the world we know, we know that we're of the spirit. The ember gets stronger, the flame starts to flicker a bit, and pretty soon you realize that all we're going to do for eternity is sit around the fire. Mm. I'm a little embarrassed hearing my own voice do that because... Uh, on the track. It's just so beautifully performed by, by Ram Das. But, um, I wanted to ask you, um, from your like really, really intimate relationship with those words and the music, mm. what is the fire? What is the ember? What do we say? Well, I think, um, let's start with the ashes. You know, we, we often feel isolated alone um and like there's we've kind of somehow been persuaded that all of this is meaningless to some degree some of us have um, many i'm of us definitely have familiar with the ashes john 
Yes, so we know where the ashes are. But then, <laughs> Didn't but ask like, about those. But I feel like, <laughs> well, in order to, to think about the ember, it's nice to think about the ashes because I feel like right. from what you said, you're familiar with the ember as well. And, um, yes. you know, I, I would say the stage I'm at is I've found that ember and I'm desperately <laughs> blowing on it and trying to rebuild the fire. But really what that ember is to me is... Um, the divine spark there's something something that you when you connect to it whether it's through meditation or psychedelics or for me it's always a you know the way the two inform each other um you sink into that place of total oneness and unity and that's that's your inherent knowledge that there is a part deep inside of you that is shared by everyone that is the divine spark um i, I mean the words for it don't really cover it but that's there and i think you touch on that sometimes people atheistic views will also touch on that through perhaps um just not use the same words but you know you can you can feel that infinite oneness through looking at a, a landscape or gazing at a loved one or being in love or you know staring into the eyes of your newborn child is like that that magic that that kind of that ineffable wonder that it's possible to feel um, and in psychedelics, you get to spend some time there. You get to spend sometimes a few hours in that state, and then you like when you when you're in there, you're like, how will I ever not be like this again? And of course, you come out and everything com comes back. Um, but in that time, you're you're fanning that ember. You're like it never. F you're not forgetting everything. You come out, okay. You go back to normal, but not quite back to normal. And each time you each time you fan it with, for me, it's like the most important thing is daily practice for sure because you know psychedelics are like they open the door and an occasion you need a reminder and they will get you there but it's what you do every day that it's got the biggest chance of fanning that ember and then as to what the fire is i like to think of it as the collective um all finding their embers and us collectively re rebuilding the knowledge of our own innate divinity that kind of um that we need in order to to make sense of this and also to survive and also it's talking about he's talking about infinity he's talking about the fact that after your you know this is obviously a belief system but it all is really um after your physical body is no longer with you um consciousness is just you know your spark of consciousness just goes back to join the rest and you're you're all one again that's what will happen in the end anyway so maybe that's what the fire is hmm it's so fascinating. I maybe it's because I I know like the title of the track or how the how the lyrics end, mm. but it did feel like there was something like collective or connecting about the ember, right? So it, it, it's mm. phrased. It's like in each of us is an ember. It's like this individual thing, mm. but. And in the, in the way you describe your sort of interpretation of what that is, it does involve connecting to others. I and then, that, yeah. and then it is explicit at the end that, that it becomes something that we share. Mm. Um, so yeah, I just found that fast. Maybe it's because we're social animals or something. I'm not sure. We are, we are. And, but also, um, you know, life is about relationships, um, ultimately. And, um, I think perhaps a lot of people that get to the end of their lives and having focused far more on, on personal ambition, they get to the end and go, oh shit, it wasn't about that, you know. And I think um, also I love the image that he conjures because obviously it's a, a metaphor, but the way he, well, he's, he's also conjuring this thing that we as humans have always done, you know, uh, since we had our modern anatomical forms and the brains that we have, we've we've had fire and we've sat around the fire and we've stared into it and it brings about a, a gentle meditative state and it's a unifying thing you sit around it not just to get warm but to to stare into it and to you can sit there having conversations and fall into silence and at no point does it feel like there's this beautiful focal point to it all um that's ever changing and it's deeply wired into what we are, I think, over 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 hundreds of thousands of years, maybe. Yeah, I I I've often think that um, the little magical devices we walk around with in our pockets, these smartphones, 
are like the 21st century version of the fire we're sitting around. It's like this light that we stare into and that connects us and stuff. Um, but it is not quite as, um, peace inducing and relaxing as Mm -hmm. actually sitting around the fire. It's quite a, quite a distance from that actually. And it's scary if you contemplate that, that get distance or that gap, um, that we're all kind of contemplating right now. Um, Mm. because there's a lot of, a lot of stress and, and suffering actually, because we're sitting around perhaps the wrong fire. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in, in a way that these things are the opposite because obviously you can control, <laughs> you can control how they're set up. Um, but you know, I, I know I have some friends who have like the news app, like sending notifications to their phone, which means you <laughs> might go on yeah. there to send a message to someone oh, and you're going to get a notification every time the worst thing that's just happened has happened. <laughs> So in the world, it's yeah, like in the world, yeah. right? So yeah. I don't know who it was who said this, but I heard on some podcasts it's just like we were not, we did not evolve to take on yes um, a daily string of the of of like information, a stream of information about the worst things that have happened to a population yes. of seven or eight billion people. Yes, um, that is not within our makeup or our capabilities, and so these devices. You know, I have mine set up with no notifications of any kind, and I only use it to communicate with other people. And but I have to use Instagram for work, and that sucks you into certain things. And you know, it's it's yes. so it's been designed to suck you in more and more and more. Yeah, and it's an object of distraction rather than connection, even though it manifests like some connections. Obviously, there's good and bad to it, like a lot of people I am connected to at the moment. I met that way. You know, other yeah. artists you meet through Instagram, whatever. There's Obviously, there's there's pos- there's pluses and minuses here, but it's definitely not the fire. And uh, it's it's <laughs> it's it, there's just we've we have a society that's like looking to create as many distractions from the fire as possible, or from the mm-hmm. innate the innate wonder behind being alive. Um, and the phone's like a hyper accelerated version of that. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I appreciate the reminder. I think I'm going to turn off all my notifications as soon as we hang up here. <laughs> <laughs> I just, don't, I don't. I mean, I just think I'm too sensitive. I cannot handle it. Yes, like there's no way I could go about my day like getting. And I've seen the way people's faces change. They, they're like having a nice time, and they look at their phone for something. Yeah. Maybe they're going to show you a picture they like, and then they'll see these things have come in. And whether it's just from their email or whatever, it's suddenly your work is suddenly in the room when it wouldn't have been. 20 years ago like you were not totally when you're off you're off and we've created the world where that is not not the case and you can obviously enforce it on your own device but it it, uh, surprisingly people so many people don't want to and it's like what you know you're creating a world where you're constantly available um yeah and there's even you know there's brain effects of staring at these these led screens all the time it's like yeah it's not again it's not natural and um it's a deviation from what we evolved for. So yeah, it's like, of course, it's a part of the fabric of how we will move things forward, hopefully, but it's definitely a very <laughs> nuanced and complicated thing. I've noticed um, since the the pandemic, I don't know what it's like where you are, but here, uh, paper menus are a thing of the past because in principle, people are concerned about the virus being transmitted through the touch, right? So you don't, they don't want to like print menus every time. They don't want to have menus that they recycle because people are touching them. So when you sit down at a restaurant now, it's a barcode. And the first thing that everybody does when they arrive is take out their phones and scan the barcodes. So you can see what you're going to eat. And then mm. five minutes later, you, you, you and your four friends are staring down at their phones and they're on Instagram or whatever. It's really mm. messed up. I really hate yeah. that. So I have to say, I, are you in Canada? Yeah. Yeah, so I did notice that there. I was there recently. It's like, wait, because we had that here briefly and everyone hated it and it, it's gone. Um, and I think it's I'm literally the opposite of an expert on COVID, but um, I do understand, I think, that the <laughs> air transmission, air transmission was more of an issue than menus. And I think there's, you know, what, what really, right. I, what I think happened um, is that this very clever tech companies out there who, sold this technology in very very quickly okay there's the qr code so now you can do it on your phone it it's, takes so much of the joy out of the experience like yes it's just, you know it, it take it makes it not sociable and like you say of course there'll be these everyone will get um barrage of other stuff coming in while they're looking at 
what yes. beer what beer they want to order, which used to be a simple, <laughs> enjoyable thing yeah. of browsing a like nice draft list list is now like scrolling. Totally. So yeah, I I hope um, I've noticed it's different in in lots of countries. Um, I haven't seen one in England for a long time now, but we fully had gone that way, and it's like oh my god, this better yeah. not be permanent. Um, in America, it was some places yes, some places no, but in Canada, everywhere was like this is it now. I was like yeah, no, come on, menus were not. Menus are not the responsible thing here. That, like, that is not the agent of transmission for this entire pandemic. Was not menus. <laughs> so, yeah, fingers crossed. Because um, there's really there's yes. direct there's direct winners to that, and it's the people that invented that technology, and they're just going great. We've nailed this. You know, come on. <laughs> <laughs> More territory where we can expect people to be looking down at their phones. I think I'm going to be feel a little more emboldened when I go to the restaurant and ask for a paper menu, not feel so awkward anymore after this chat. Um, we're, we're coming up on an hour here and I, I'm, I want to be respectful of your time. Really enjoyed our conversation so far. I wanted to ask you about <clears throat> what it's like. The album has been out for a number of months. You're probably getting lots of feedback. Um, so I'm curious about that. Why don't we start there? And then I'm going to, I have one more question for you related to that. So what, this is really personal stuff, really precise, as we talked about before, what has it been like to see it out in the world and to know that you have this intimate connection with all these people? Well, it's, it's really, um, the only word I keep coming back to is it's an honor. It's just this crazy honor. And I don't feel, because I know how messy my internal world is and, you know, uh, I think um, to me it seems kind of ridiculous that people I meet think I might know anything at all um, because I don't really in terms of how to deal with like my life as messy as anyone's but the album has something on it um, that doesn't come from me it comes from way beyond it's the plants and medicines I've interacted with all the other people I've interacted with and also just being alive in the universe all, that's, all that stuff is there um, and I'm just a sort of vessel that it came through. Um, so sometimes when I meet people who think I might have something interesting to offer beyond that album, they will go away disappointed <laughs> as a general rule. But um, I just think it's incredible that it can be helpful. Um, and yeah, you know, some of the responses have been really moving and really, really extraordinary. That's beautiful. Um, you've done different kinds of music uh and i'm thinking for some reason of like the dance music where you know you can play a dj set and people will dance or djs can take your music and and mm -hmm. people will dance and stuff or um and of course the whole like dj set or concert experience uh has also been what put under the microscope uh, or disrupted mm. by COVID mm. as well. I haven't been to a concert in many years. Oh, really? Um, yeah, yeah. I also have little kids who are the real culprit here, but sure. um, it's just there hard to are. get out. But um, <laughs> um, what I wanted to ask you is, yeah, what's it like sort of performing or, or getting this stuff out? And I will say that I did go to Music as Medicine in LA hmm. and it was really mind blowing. So I don't know if that qualifies as a concert. I did go to that, hmm. but I'm not sure it does. Uh, and no, that wasn't really. I was there with. Yeah. Sorry. Karen. I was there with my wife. Yeah. Nah, um, I, sorry, I'm talking so much here, but I wanted to share with you. I was there with my wife and. Um, we were both just like so touched. And I think that, you know, Peyton, who's the, I guess the, the host on behalf of Numinous and East Forest uh, kind of said a few words before and just set the container mm. so beautifully mm. um, that we were all sort of there to heal in our own way. So it did not feel like a concert, even though there were 300 people there to listen to music together. Yeah. Um, and I just found it so touching and <clears throat> like, and so beautiful. And my, my wife and I were, were just chatting, like, what the hell was that? It's like, she used to go, she used to be, uh, like go to a bunch of raves when she was younger. So it's like, mm. it's a bit like a chill out room at a rave. So she, that was familiar to her. But she said, but 
and I'm, I have a meditation background. It's like, felt like a group meditation, mm -hmm. maybe like a perfect actually marriage for her and me. Um, but again, like what the hell was that? And is this something you're going to be doing more of? And yeah. So just your thoughts on, on concerts and music as medicine as a kind of event. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think at this particular thing you're describing, um, music as medicine event as was the second, um, the first, um, Aubrey Marcus hosted in, um, Austin, um, last, uh, September, I think it was. And that was the first time anyone had heard the album. That was like the album premiere before it came out. And, um, it was one of the most moving and powerful things I experienced just to suddenly be sharing my entire soul with this room full of people who are, a lot of whom are, are, you know, quite deeply, deeply into the medicine and the people doing breath work and there's even some chanting, there's a lot of crying, there's a lot of breathing, there was a lot going on, it was an intense thing. And you're right, yes, it has elements in common with with those other things, but it, it's, a, it's a new thing, you know, and um, East Forest has been pioneering this for a bit with his ceremonial format concerts, but also um, Secular Sabbath, which is a beautiful series of events, um, has this um this sort of california based but they do events in different different places which has a kind of um it's about intentional listening as well and people sitting around doing things together and um you know these things are popping up in different places in different ways because of a collective desire to 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 experience them and to experience them together um you know like so far all that i've done at these things is, is had the album played back but through you know multi-channel formats and to people who are all listening together otherwise it's you know so that's what makes it different from listening on your own and then i tend to if i'm there we'll do a piano improvisation at the end but over time i want to work out ways of doing something that's kind of more live i don't think it will be it will never be like live versions of that album in its in the order it's in but you know maybe i'll be making more of a kind of a set that involves more of that kind of stuff for people that are lying down um but i still love the dance music thing and i still love because it's it's it can be equally spiritual in in um what people can experience you know there can be such a i like kind of sneaking that into the dance floor you know <laughs> through hiding these drone drones in there like, you might have a kick drum but that's you know really it's just like a drumming circle which is also a, a part of the spiritual practice um for a lot of people so you know i think these things are just finding their way out because they need to mm cool really appreciate that um i wonder uh if there's anything else you'd like to share something we didn't cover something that you wanted to say that didn't get a chance to say from earlier i'd just like to say thank you for the questions and the conversation because it was really it was great it was really interesting and um you know touched on a lot of new things for me um so yeah i hope um i hope it's been fun for you as well very much so and again, thank you so much for making the time and for chatting and can't wait to uh, discover more of what you're creating. Oh, thanks very much, Jeff. Cheers. Thanks for watching this episode of the Mindspace Podcast. To get more episodes, you can subscribe on this channel or go to your favorite podcast platform. Thanks and be well. Be well.